I recently started building an RC car called the Badger uh, using my 3D printer. Uh, the designer, my apologies to the Norwegians, Tor Arn Hustvid, uh, created this uh, about a year ago. Uh, he's got another design called the MK Ultra. Uh, really excellent designs, and I thought I'd document my process through this maybe to help others uh, that are uh, that want to undertake it. Now the audience for this is designed for relatively newcomers. Uh, myself, I don't have a ton of experience, uh, but uh, if you're new to 3D printing and you're interested in getting into making something a little more uh, difficult than the models uh, that you've come across, certainly uh, remote control cars and boats and uh, drones can be really interesting things to make. Um, there's a bunch of uh, 3D car uh, designers out there. 3D Sets is one company that produces some really nice designs and I uh, started off creating uh, uh, a little uh, yellow dune buggy that you'll see at the top here using 3D Sets. That sort of got me interested in the, in the remote control uh, car area. But there are other really good designs out there. The Tarmo, the MK Ultra Badger, uh, Roback 2 and they're very low cost and a lot of them are free. Now sometimes the uh, builder assumes that you're experienced in mechanics of RC models, uh, maybe in 3D printing, so you, you get limited instruction in how you'll uh, best actually print each of these parts. So I'm hoping that maybe this will help uh, start your path in learning how to print uh, reliable and accurate parts uh, as you might want to undertake these models. So I'm a relative novice. I've only had my uh, Prusa MK3 for uh, a little under uh, six months and certainly I hadn't been involved in RC cars before but I'm retired now so I was looking for a project to undertake that uh, might, be, uh, might be somewhat challenging. And as an instructor I, I sort of have a, a sense of, of what types of challenges people run across when they try to print this type of stuff out. So I thought I might pass some of this along. One of the best starting points I've come across was uh, at this uh, website, which gives instructions for how do I create accurate parts. Um, one of the first tools you'll need here, as it's shown here, is a caliper. Digital caliper is uh, a must. But when you calibrate your printer, uh, and, and some printers don't need much calibration, and you, you don't want to go nuts with this. You can get analysis paralysis. I have a, a Prusa MK3 Plus which I built from a kit and it didn't really need much calibration but if you go through these printing instructions they'll show you about calibrating your printer and uh, they'll give you a little calibration cube that you see here that you can print. Once you print it you can uh, measure it with your caliper to see if it's the right dimensions. One thing you'll notice with 3D parts is that uh, holes tend to be undersized, so don't worry if they're undersized. Uh, you have a 3mm, 2mm hole that is only 2.8. Uh, that's typical. However, your part that you print should be accurate. Here the overall dimension of this is 35 to 28 millimeters. That should be accurate. And your bearing should fit even if they fit snugly, and they will probably fit snugly, they should be able to be pushed in um, or coerced in in other ways, uh, a little force, uh, but you don't want to damage the bearing. You can always drill out uh, a hole that's undersized a little bit, but you want to make sure your printer is somewhat close to being calibrated, and so you can use that as a, a reference. For filament choices, I I uh, sort of just went between PETG or PLA and, and different designers will, will have different ideas, I think. Uh, I chose a PLA Pro, which is a little stronger than PLA. It's still a little ductile. PLA can be a little brittle. That's why some choose PETG. PETG has a, a much higher temperature resistance, and so you'll use PETG for motor mounts or small gears, anything that's going to become hot. But that's what I chose when creating the Badger design. I used Polymakers Polylite PC Polycarbonate, which can withstand much higher temperatures and it's much more rigid. It's great for those small pinion gears uh, or lay gears that are small. And I used TPU, uh, which is a very flexible filament for the tires. Now you're still going to get 
uh, a lot of skidding with these tires. The tires that I created are designed for dirt or grass, uh, but for really good tires you need rubber. One of the real enemies of 3D printing is humidity and I live near the ocean and it's been in the last three months uh, no less than 70% humidity. So all filament is hygroscopic and will absorb moisture. PLA being uh, will absorb the least and polycarbonate and nylon the most but I still have to um, consider humidity and from the picture underneath it shows uh, the strings in point A and point B. You can see on the left, if you have a very humid um, filament, what can happen compared to drying. So the precautions that I take, I made uh, from the picture, you can see three homemade, uh, from homemade cereal containers that are relatively airtight. They've got a gasket in. I get, just got it at the local hardware store. And I fill them with 25 grams of desiccant and uh, once I dry them, and you can see that I just have a cheap dryer above, many will consider this is not a suitable, it's too cheap, but uh, you need some type of dryer to dry your filament. Even new filament that I've gotten from some manufacturers has moisture in it. So I don't dry out every filament once I open it, but some uh, certainly I do. Every time I use polycarbonate, I dry it before I use it, even if I seal it in a um, airtight container. So I print, uh, because some of the prints can take eight to 10 hours, I print all my uh, filaments in, um, in dry boxes there. And so on the left in the brown, the blue is my PLA Pro, and on the right, uh, the yellow is uh, PETG, and uh, that's my print setup here. So try to um, assess your humidity in your area and you may need to take these types of uh, precautions. Many people just print from open spools. If Certainly if you have humidity at 30% or less, you don't need to take some of these precautions. But if you get a lot of stringing, and stringing can be a result of retraction settings, but uh, often it's, uh, it's a result of moisture in your filament. And you'll know that by hearing hissing and popping. Uh, as your uh, filaments extruding. I used a bunch of different layer heights and if you just get the STL models you may not have recommendations on model heights so I'll show you the three that I use for this uh, this uh, badger print. Uh, for the main frame I used point two at, uh, the first time with an older PLA I reprinted it with PLA Pro and I just didn't want to wait nine hours so I used point three and for that because there wasn't a lot of detail in the Z direction I think point three is going to work fine. Most parts uh, the designer recommends uh, 0.2 millimeter and that works fine for most of the models. For really small parts I did go to a smaller layer height either 0.15 or 0.1 with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle that I'm using probably 0.1 is the smallest you want to go and still be accurate. But you'll have to choose uh, sort of optimum layer heights and you can try one layer height and maybe choose uh, another if that doesn't work out. Some of the other parameters I used, I used pretty well 100% infill on most of the small parts, so there wasn't a lot of infill areas, mostly there were arms and thinner parts, um, but if you have some bulk areas, you certainly could use 50% uh, infill in uh, uh, most of the parts. But I did use a lot of perimeters, so six perimeters around the holes, uh, top and bottom layers. If you have to drill out a hole, and you only have one or two perimeters, you might drill out all the perimeters and get into the infill. So six perimeters gives you a lot of strength around some of the holes. Um, you also want good adhesion between your layers, and we'll talk about that in the strength section. To get good adhesion, one thing you can do is up the temperature and go to the hotter end of the standard. So for the PLA Pro, I went closer to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the fan that can cool your part, um, you can consider zero uh, fan if you, you think you might want uh, good adhesion, but really you shouldn't go with 100, you shouldn't go with zero. You really want to start about 50% with PLA and then you can adjust it up and down. We'll talk why that is uh, 
if you're looking for good adhesion, you don't want to cool down a lot of your PLA, but you also don't want uh, stringing. And uh, if you're bridging, you may want uh, a certainly more fan. We'll see that before. But those are some of the settings I used. But we only learn from our failures, so don't look at print failures being a bad thing. You'll learn much more when your print fails and you can fix it. So one of the things that uh, I find with some of the designers is that r they're really expert at uh, calibrating their printers and they can have huge uh, supports um, or bridging that, uh, that works very well. But when I was printing something like uh, the wheel here, uh, I had real drooping inside here when I first printed my first hub. And so I found I had to add support. And what I did was I added five little layers of support. Now, you can tell here the bridge lines go in this direction. And so your support should go at right angles to it. So always consider your bridge, your bridging direction. And you can look in your slicer, look down in the layers to see what direction your bridging will take. Over here, you can see the bridging goes this way. So I added supports. Uh, I think I added about two strips of support. I did not let the machine generate the supports. I painted on the supports, and I'll show that in a second. But uh, support, adding additional supports can help. If you'll look in here, although you'll see a little bit of the leftover support, my uh, surface area is really uh, quite good here, uh, as, it is, as it is here. And certainly a lot better than it would be uh, without the supports. So in Prusa Slicer, you can actually paint on supports, but other slicers have, have similar types of characteristics. And here's the part where I added supports, I painted them on. I added a little support for the bearing pocket and supports for here, and you'll see later why that was. Um, when I paint on supports, I can determine how much Z clearance I'm going to have, that is how much distance this support's going to have to the uh, model on the top and the bottom. I opted for 0.2 and this is a 0.2 layer height here. 100% uh, clearance from the model so the support isn't going to butt right up against the model and fuse to it and be harder to remove. So although this looks like a lot of support, this is very trivial to, uh, to remove. Now I also used what's called a snug fit. That's what something Prusa Slicer provides. What that means is it provides the support in just these strips that I paint on makes it easier to remove. Now another issue that I ran into in doing some of these models was curling. And curling happens when uh, you're printing on an overhang. There's no support underneath of it and the layer just curls up. So now you have some plastic that is above the layer that the nozzle's on. And as the nozzle's going back and forth between these two, it's going to hit the curl on the way back and it's probably going to move uh, your model significantly. I've got a brim around here, but it can very easily unseat your model or it can generate uh, a crash detection as well. But generally your model fails. And so this generally happens when you have bridging uh, or overhangs that aren't supported. Now you also have it in bearing pockets too. Uh, often you won't see any supports for bearing pockets, but if the bearing's big, you'll see an area here. As you get to the top of the circle, you run into an area that's greater than 45 degree overhang, and printers have issues with that. So if you're very hot on this overhang issue, you'll tend to get a little curling your print head will hit it and then your print will fail at this point. So what can we do to help uh, solve this because we have hot nozzles because we're trying to get a stronger part? Well, you really, you really have to cool, go with a cooler nozzle. So in some of this, uh, for instance this one here, I went uh, from 220 degrees down to 205 degrees. I went to 100% fan, so my fan would cool the part right away and help prevent this curling up. You can go a little slower. If you have just minimal curling, you can adjust what's called your Z-hop or your Z-lift, 
which means that after it's finished here, it usually will retract before it goes up here, but you want it to move up in the Z direction over and down. That's called Z hop. So you can adjust that to say a millimeter. So I had curling hair that was about three millimeters, even that didn't, didn't help very much. You can also add some support. Adding support will mean this overhang here will get a little adhesion from the support, especially if you put the support close, maybe 0.1. Um, away and so it will prevent it from curling up. You can also change the model uh, if you have access to Fusion and want to bring in the STL model for your printer you could extend out the foot and make this angle um, much less than 45 degrees. I think in this model I got up to about a 60 this was about 60 percent and you can see from my model here that's where it started to deteriorate. Now even though it looks bad this model still fine and I can still use it. But curling can be an issue, and these are some of the things you can do to prevent the curling. So here's uh, one of the models that uh, when I ran into this curling issue, you can sort of see the little curling here. Um, so what did I do? I reduced the temperature. I added support, and you can see uh, the support structure here from the build plate. Uh, I went from 50% to 100% fan, and this was the resulting model, so the model was certainly much more successful than here. And I also had a better, because I supported the, uh, the uh, pocket for the bearing, I have better, uh, more accuracy. Uh, you can't see it too well here, but my accuracy is much better in this model uh, than it was here, where there was no support. And sometimes you can you can get some drooping in here, which means the bearing won't fit, and then you'll need to uh, sort of mill that out with a Dremel tool or file it out in some way. Now, print orientation is a major factor on strength, and let's just consider these little uh, cylinders here. Consider that uh, layer lines act like grains in wood. So as you're printing this, if you're printing it standing up, whoops, all the layer lines go like this. Well, if this is a, a pin that is connecting two pieces together, a lower piece and an upper piece, and there are some shear forces that are acting on this left to right, that's gonna break right across that shear line. This is not gonna be a very strong way to print this pin. So if we have a pin that's trying to prevent shearing of two parts, we're better off laying this pin on its side, and all your layer lines then go this way. Now, as you stand this up, it's going to be much, much stronger than this because you're going to have your grain going up and down. And so it can withstand those shear forces. So the way you orient your print is really determined on how the forces are acting on that print. So you'll have a lot of failures, especially if you have a, a car that's going to be abused and you're going to jump it and a lot of parts are gonna break, so you need to analyze them and look at the print orientation. Now there's a good video here on a, a guy that was making uh, from a bot uh, RC car. Uh, he 3D printed some parts that tended to break and it's interesting to look at the orient, he did some testing on the orientation uh, of parts and, and how it affected the strength. And it's quite an interesting video, you might want to take a look at that. Now this is an area where you're going to learn uh, over a long period of time, so you never stop learning about better print orientation for strength. Now one of the things I did, and this probably came from my engineering background, is I started to make custom uh, profiles for uh, various layers and what this allowed me to do is uh, tweak some of the settings. Uh, the, these are good, uh, especially with my Prusa slicer, these are sort of the system defaults and these are good starting points so I start building a profile just by copying one of these. But PLA Pro I couldn't move as fast, couldn't print as fast, so I went from 80 millimeters per second down to 70 temperature was a little different. So you can store all these in a profile and then you can tweak them as you're finding certain things may not be working. Then if you come back uh, a month or two, uh, you've got a setting and you're using this filament again. I don't tend to make profiles based on color, but sometimes the color pigments that they use in certain, uh, certain uh, filaments do can make a difference. But by far one of the best things I did was make an actual uh, in, 
uh, 3MF file and a 3MF file for each of the prints that I use stores not only your uh, layer height but all your print settings and your filaments settings things like uh, uh, temperature and retraction rate and all those things so if I have a particularly successful print on this uh, rear arm I can just pull this file up double click it uh, and a month later I don't need to wonder gee I wonder what temperature I used with that filament or what uh, speed I used so it's easier to duplicate successful prints and for ones that don't work it's a good starting point for evolving it so you can make little tweaks to it you can copy it first and then make tweaks to it to see if that's uh, better if it's not you can go back to your uh, original save one make a different type of tweaks so I just find this is an invaluable way to help evolve your parts to uh, to be better. So those are just some of the uh, some of the things that I've done to uh, uh, to help make a more successful print, and maybe they'll help you uh, along your journey.